It was Oklahoma's first mass murder, and it terrified its residents. The panic became worse when the authorities were able to link the gun used in the Sirloin Stockade murders to the murders of the North Dakota family in Purcell, Oklahoma. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back to the beginning, back before Roger Dell Stafford became the most wanted man in Oklahoma. Roger Dell Stafford was born November 4th, 1951 in Sheffield, Alabama, but not much else is known of our convicted spree killer's past. While Stafford never acknowledged his own guilt and denied his own involvement in the killings, and while Stafford's wife Verna implicated him of a total of 34 murders in seven different states, most never proven, his crimes were horrendous nonetheless. Stafford began his killing spree on January 12, 1974, killing 21-year-old Jimmy Earl Berry, a student of University of North Alabama, who was working as an assistant manager at the Muscle Shoals McDonald's, also located in Alabama. Jimmy Berry was shot four times while the perpetrator robbed the restaurant for a grand total sum of $1,390. US The crime remained unsolved for four years until Verna Stafford, Roger Stafford's wife, notified the police that the killer was indeed her husband and his brother, Harold Stafford. Even with the testimony of the Stafford's wives, of, of the Stafford's wife, neither he nor his brother was ever convicted for Jimmy Berry's murder. Fast forward a few years to June 22, 1978, and the Lorenz family were driving northbound on Interstate 35, passing by the small town of Purcell, Oklahoma, on their way from their duty station. Yes, Sergeant Melvin and Sergeant Linda Lorenz were both part of the U.S. Air Force in San Antonio, Texas. They were traveling with their son, Richard. The trip was already an unpleasant one, for it was to attend the funeral of Melvin Lorenz's mother. But little did they know, it was about to get much, much worse. Melvin and Linda were flagged down by what appeared to be a stranded lady whose car had broke down on the side of the road. Little did the Lorenz family know, but that woman that waved them down was none other than Verna Stafford. Melvin pulled over on the shoulder to help the woman like any other good Samaritan would. But now the Lorenz family fell right into the trap that was created by the family of killers. Verna Stafford later recounted to the court on how Roger and his brother Harold were lurking in the shadows out of sight until Melvin came close to their car. As soon as Melvin approached, Roger confronted his gun drawn. Roger demanded his wallet, but Melvin wouldn't give it to him, Verna said. Roger got upset, so he shot him. Then the lady came up to the car screaming, she told McLean County Courthouse. Linda Lorenz tried to stop their attackers, but Verna fought back. I caught her on the side of the face. That's when my husband Roger shot her. Afterwards, the Stafford heard a voice calling from the Slane's parent camper on the back of their truck. It was Melvin and Linda's son, Richard. Roger said something along the lines of not leaving anyone behind as witnesses, and then he used his pocket knife to cut a hole in the screen of the camper and shot Richard, ending his life. The Staffords dumped the bodies of Melvin, 38, Linda, 31, and Richard, 13, in the closest field, a crime that only took them a grand total of 20 minutes to complete. Afterwards, they took the Lorenz's truck and abandoned it at Will Rogers Airport in Oklahoma City. On the stand, Verna confessed that it was her idea to pretend to be the stranded motorist to lure in unsuspecting victims while her husband robbed them. Verna stated that her and her husband needed money so that they could find a place to rent in Tulsa, Oklahoma for her, him, and their three kids, while Harold did it so that his girlfriend could get an abortion. And in my opinion, one less of them is better. Killing came easy to the Staffords, especially Roger, who told his cellmate that he just banged away when it came time to rob the Lorenzes. It didn't make a difference whether the person was 2 or 82, their age didn't matter. But the story doesn't end here. Just three weeks later, the Staffords struck again. On July 16, 1978, the spree killers again traveled from Tulsa to Oklahoma City in search of a place to rob. On that day, the Staffords pulled up to the Sirloin Stockade restaurant, waiting till all the customers left. At 10 p.m., the Staffords left their car and knocked on the side door of the Sirloin Stockade. 
The manager opened the door, and to his surprise, both Roger and Harold were standing there, guns drawn, forcing their way inside. When inside, the manager, 43-year-old Louis Zacharias, made the worst decision of his life that consequently cost his and five other people's lives, including Isaac Freeman, aged 56, David Lindsay, aged 17, David Salzman, aged 16, Anthony Thu, 17, and Terry Horst, who was only 15 years old. The manager, Luis Zacharias, would taunt the three killers by saying, I cannot understand why people would choose to rob others instead of working for themselves. Roger Stafford then hit Lewis in the face with his gun before demanding that he call all of his employees to the register. Harold and Verna held the workers at gunpoint while Roger and Lewis emptied the safe for a grand total of 1,290 US dollars. Roger then demanded that everyone gather in the walk-in freezer. Verna would later testify that Harold would remind Roger that no one was to be hurt, to which Roger would reply, they'll all get what they deserve before shooting them all execution style. And according to Verna, he started with the only black employee and ended with putting the gun in Verna's hand and helping her pull the trigger. I do love how people tend to make themselves the victims in things like this, even though clearly an accessory to murder at this point. When I opened the freezer, all I could see was blood and brains, stated Sergeant Lanny Mitchell, the first officer to arrive on the scene. It was totally incomprehensible. One boy sat slumped between a stack of beef boxes blonde hair peeking out from under his trucker's cap, head dipped down, as if almost asleep at church. While fleeing the scene of the crime, the Staffords nearly crashed their green station wagon, and the driver who they almost wrecked into got a good look at the man behind the wheel, Roger Stafford. In addition, a man had just pulled up to pick up his girlfriend from the Sirloin Stockade, who had also seen the Staffords fleeing the scene. On top of that, in a bit of karmic justice, Harold Stafford died in a motorcycle wreck just a week after the murders took place at the Sirloin Stockade. For six months, investigators would follow countless leads across five states, but they would find no one. It seemed Roger and Verna Stafford got away, that the Staffords would never be caught and brought to justice. But, as you can tell, the story does not end here, not with all the information we have on the killers. Karma and the universe has some strange tricks up his sleeves. On the evening of January 3rd, 1979, the police received an anonymous phone call that was traced back to a drunken Roger Stafford blaming his wife and brother for the killings. The police eventually tracked down Verna in Chicago, and after arresting her and gaining the whereabouts of Roger, he was also arrested March 13th, 1979 in the YMCA parking lot. Roger Stafford would get the death row sentence for all the murders, but predicted his sentence would not be carried out, because I am too good looking, Roger stated. But he was wrong. The state of Oklahoma would finally put down the cold-blooded killer, Roger Dell Stafford, in 1995 by lethal injection. Roger spent a total of 15 and a half years on death row. I would like to tell you that you are seeing an innocent man being murdered, stated Roger, now 43 in his final statement. Truth and justice, they said. They said truth would set you free, but it didn't set me free. I have nothing to lose by telling a lie. Somewhere, somehow, someplace, somebody, please exonerate me and give me the peace of my name back. He then told his now wife, who he had married while in prison, Mickey, I love you. Mickey, meet me at the heaven's gates. It only took eight minutes for the deadly concoction of lethal injection to wipe out Roger's existence as he did to so many others. I personally don't think Mickey will ever see the murderer standing there at the gates waiting for her. If there is a hell, that is definitely where Roger will be for the heinous acts he committed in his life. We cannot forget about his loving first wife though, now Verona Monk, can we? At her trial in Oklahoma City, Verna received two consecutive life terms. Verna was up for parole last year but was denied. She will not be up for another parole for another few years, but hopefully she'll be denied again. It's a crime the Staffords almost got away with, if not for a drunken call. More killers that almost got away with their crimes. Now I don't want to say that if you liked the video, but if you did like the video, please do like the video. And don't forget to subscribe, I will try to have a video up at least once a week. Be safe, 
and I'll see you all again next time in the darkest hour.